I wanted some things answered. And so I went on a journey for the past three years to answer these questions, to meet with people that could actually fulfill what I was looking for. And I want to take you on the journey that I've been on so I can show you what I learned. Because I can promise you this, we've all been affected in this world and we're not that far apart. How do people react when they learn something they believe to be true is not true? At first, they're in disbelief. That's America's housing market. And then once they realize they've been deceived, they get angry. Oh, oh, you! They don't want to believe they were deceived. I've always said it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. Unfortunately, this is where we are as a population today. Psychological warfare, what it basically means is to change the perception of reality, yeah, that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions. Um, and in watching and kind of looking out and, and making sure that all of the members in our community are using these tools in a way that's going to be good and healthy. There's no need to walk. Everything you need to be happy. So people assume uh, we are just going back uh, to the good old world which we had um, and everything will be normal again in how we are used to normal in the old fashion. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. It will not happen. Most people, Mike, only care about what's 50 feet from their door. Although the ways we've received our stories have changed, the power of story has remained the same. It's a fairly new, I think, sense that all expertise is false. If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed. No, I don't trust the media. If, if that's the question, that's my answer. Everybody in the world right now knows something's amiss. Something's not right. There's a, there's a paradigm shift happening and people can feel it in their guts that things are changing. And right now, I think that's where we are as a world. I think the world knows we're missing something. And what we're gonna show you is what you're missing is you don't have all the information. The public needs to understand how they were manipulated, why they were manipulated, and who is manipulating them. Because until you understand those things, those simple things, you're not gonna understand how to ask the right questions to find out what is the truth and to find out how to critically think about and assess the information that you're receiving. You know, are we witnessing the end of an American empire? The homeless crisis in our country has gone from bad to worse. And I've talked to a lot of people that are experts in all these fields 
And they have given me some information that I feel like is super important. I need to share it with you because until you guys understand the techniques and tactics that have been used on you through media and music and basically our whole lives, because it's the stories. It goes back to story every time. Who's controlling the story? Where are we hearing it? And do we care to go look any further? And most of the time, no one cares to look any further than a headline or cares to look any further than what their friend who they trust tells them is real. You need to understand you're being manipulated. And if you don't understand how you're being manipulated, you're never going to be able to fight it. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. On this journey, there was one person that was really uh, pushing for the truth, and she didn't care what it cost. The same. American soldiers continue to die because of the support Pakistan gives to America's enemies. And you just stated the truth. That's got to make you mad. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Only the truth stands up to questioning. So you should never, ever mind being challenged or questioned so when people say all the time how do i find the truth that's how you find it challenge it question it test it and what's left standing is the only thing that matters getting to the truth now i think is difficult for most people i was 19 years old and i was deployed to the war in the former yugoslavia one of my jobs was to pull message traffic. Really, it was me tuning my mind because a lot of that information coming in wasn't true. And you don't want to make the wrong call because an operation could be spun from the wrong information and people could get hurt. So I really had to refine my ability to think critically. What is the most truth out of all of this information? And only pass off the good information. And, and that's what I got really good at. You have people all over the country, people out at sea, right? People on ships, people in the intelligence agencies. I was also in a place where I could watch the media report on the war. So I would take my breaks and I'd sit there and watch Sky News, BBC, CNN, you name it. And they're there talking about the war. And it didn't line up with what I was experiencing both visually and both through all the information coming in from around the war. And I said, why would they be saying that? That's, that's not true. And I would see this go on a lot. And then it just dawned on me that they're just telling them what the military want them to hear. Then I started picking up their narratives. They were trying to glorify the reason we were in this war. They were trying to get the American population to support Bill Clinton's war because he was the one that got us involved in the conflict. We will have the chance to help stop the killing of innocent civilians, especially children. It is the right thing to do. I want to use the words of one of the people who didn't make it. His name is Gary Webb. Please welcome Mr. Gary Webb to the show. So for people who don't know, Gary Webb was the journalist. He wrote about the CIA bringing crack cocaine into the U.S. It was an outrageous story. I mean, I admit it, but um, it was true. He was at first celebrated when the Pulitzer, so on and so on. And then the CIA began to leak behind the scenes to the Washington Post. And they poked holes in his story and he ended up being stripped of everything and then finally dying. I don't know anyone who can shoot themselves twice in the head. However, officially, that's suicide is his form of death. But before he died, he wrote these words. 
I was winning awards, getting raises, lecturing college classes, appearing on TV shows, and judging journalism contests. And then I wrote some stories that made me realize how sadly misplaced my bliss had been. The reason I'd enjoyed such smooth sailing for so long hadn't been as I'd assumed because I was careful and diligent and good at my job. The truth was that in all those years, I hadn't written anything important enough to suppress. In my world, when I started seeing agendas in the storylines that were not entertainment, they were like shifting a culture. They were placing ideas in the entertainment to move a narrative, to move a storyline. The reason messaging is so important is because if you have control of messaging, you can manipulate, you can unite, which is what we try to do, or divide societies. I was recruited to go work in intelligence. And as I started doing that, it just felt natural to me. I mean, it was a way to serve my country, and it was also a way to help other people. We touched on psychological operations and out of shadows, but we've gone deeper. These types of operations didn't just go away, they continued to evolve in step with technology. Or that he's trying to undermine the media, trying to make up his own facts, control right. uh, exactly what people think. And that is the that is if our you, job. Yeah. That is if our job. That is if, our job. I went on a journey to talk to the best people at the highest level of psychological operations in the world. Psychological warfare is the most powerful type of warfare that can be implemented in a battle. Basically, a psychological operation is an operation intended to influence a target audience. In the past, during other, other generations of war, we're in the fifth generation of war now, but in other generations of war, PSYOP has always existed. The difference is, in today's world, it's no longer an ancillary supporting task or part of a, a, an operation. It's not ancillary, it's not supporting anymore. Now in the fifth generation of warfare, the PSYOP is the primary objective. When we talk about generations of war, it's no different than talking about generations of people. Just like we have boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, so on and so forth, we also have generations of war. In the first generation war, we have pre-gunpowder. That's where you're seeing stuff like Leonidas, and you're seeing folks out there with swords, and they're whacking each other you know, on fields. And then you go into post-gunpowder. Now you're seeing guys in the same fields, except now they're shooting each other and bayoneting each other. We get into the third generation of war, now we're bringing on things like aircraft. We're bringing on things like trench warfare, bringing on things like machine guns. Now things start getting very intense. We're also bringing in nuclear power at this point in time. Fourth generation of war, now we've got not just countries fighting each other, but now we've got state and non-state actors with NGOs. Terrorism starts coming into play. It's this organization working for this country, infiltrating another country, and making the populace change. Now in fifth generation of war, everybody's separated. There are no lines to fight on, but the cognitive battle space in each country is being fought over. The U.S. is trying to infiltrate other people's populace. Other people are infiltrating our populace. And it's all done through primarily social media. What people don't understand is we're in the middle of war, and the war is for your conscious mind. We've all been influenced by these types of operations or information warfare. In warfare, you have to say, Who's the audience? There's a different set of narratives that have to be created in order to do that. You have to look at how are those people being communicated to. So some of the planning would be immediately take over the radio stations, right, in the days of your, and take over the TV stations. And you would literally, uh, maybe even the, the telephone networks, if they had telephone networks, right? Ultimately, it's about conducting influence operations to get people to start thinking a certain way, 
So you change their attitude towards a certain situation, which in turn changes their behavior altogether. It could be something as simple as mine awareness. You want to make sure that civilians and little kids aren't walking up on mines, getting their stuff blown up. So you put together a campaign to show, hey, this is what a mine looks like, and this is why you should stay away from them, this is what you should do if you see them. It can be very simple like that. Psychological warfare is the most effective and preferred type of warfare. It's what we call fifth generation warfare. Churchill saw this early on, once we had weapons of mass destruction and people could literally annihilate entire populations. He recognized that there would have to be something that came about more powerful than that. during the uprisings, during COVID, it would be hard for anyone not to be able to acknowledge the fact that everything they believed, and then they looked at other people, and they're like, how does this group believe something so different than what I believe? How can they possibly see this frame of reference so different? Well, that's because of feedback loops. Each one of these aggregates of groups was in a feedback loop unto themselves. So all of a sudden, these people over here are rioting, all this stuff's going up, and these people over here go, how is that even happening? I don't even see what you see. How do you see what you see? And these people are doing it going, how can you not see what I see? So you've got all these people in different feedback loops that can't see how everybody else has a different frame of reference. When you have that scenario happening, you're looking at a very, very well done, well planned psychological operation. It's the most insidious type of warfare because it's designed to change a person's entire perspective. And reversing that is very difficult. You don't go into a PSYOPs operation with an antidote. It's, it's designed to gain an effect, short term or long term, that's not to be reversed. There is another very important phase of warfare. It has as its target not the body, but the mind of the enemy. Ad agencies were born and baptized in the fire of psychological warfare. Propaganda has been used all throughout history to influence the masses. Specifically, in American history, we've seen it used to recruit for war, to influence public opinion, and for economic reasons. In the 1920s, people such as Edward Bernays understood the power of propaganda. Most of the public's never heard of Edward Bernays. There's different men throughout history that were the fathers of these shaping operations. Sigmund Freud was Eddie Bernays' uncle. He was the man who told him exactly how to understand human psychology and how to use it. He used psychology in an understanding of why people behave the way they do to help tie them to his clients, be they companies or politicians. Edward Bernays understood the hive mind, that you could use people's hidden desires to motivate and move the masses in any direction. In his book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, Bernays says, a crowd does not merely mean a physical aggregation of a number of persons. The crowd is rather a state of mind. You don't even know these people's names and these are people that have influenced your entire lives. They've influenced our entire culture. Edward Bernays, the reason we eat bacon and eggs is because of Edward Bernays. He's the reason nine out of 10 doctors say. I mean, he was the guy who came up with all this stuff. The fascinating thing about Edward Bernays is he has a nephew named Mark Randolph. And Mark Randolph was one of the co-founders of this little company called Netflix. What other company today has more influence over our culture than Netflix? These techniques are so consistent because human nature doesn't change and history is linear. And so if you want to change history, you don't change it by changing human nature. Advertising is based on one thing, happiness. And you know what happiness 
is happiness is the smell of a new car it's freedom from fear it's a billboard on the side of the road that screams with reassurance that whatever you're doing it's okay so now these tools can be used for good or bad hollywood advertising music sports gaming social media all of those things are tools all those things are tools that they use to message now are they good or bad that depends on who's behind the message and that depends on who's driving the narrative and that battle's been going on since the beginning of time media is more of a short-term or acute tool so you can use it to start shaping amplify it continue it or change it when you're talking about using the media that's something that you shape the media to do the shaping that you want and that shaping may be by instilling the people you want there or getting the people that are there to do what you want them to do so you have to pre-shape the shaping or what we call prep the battle space for an information war in a war you conduct all sorts of operations uh, deception operations uh, behind the lines activity sabotage all the rest of it uh, and I was involved in that and the OSS was involved in that the CIA from the very beginning at least as early as 1951 has used the information that it has collected in order to penetrate and to manipulate the institutions of power in whatever country it is operating the film industry signs up in the campaign to help answer communist lies Mr. Cecil B. DeVille says, Signing the Freedom Scroll today will cost you less than a minute of your time. Let it be your firm commitment to this warfare for the minds of men. When we, the CIA, wanted to circulate disinformation on a particular issue, disinformation is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a lie, it may be a half-truth. And uh, we would pick out a journalist. I would go do the briefing and uh, hope that he would put the information in print. It's my view, and it's supportable by all the uh, evidence you see in the Church Committee report, the Pike Committee report. The CIA is not an intelligence agency. It's a covert action agency, covert action being uh, overthrowing or supporting foreign governments. Another part of covert action is disinformation. And the uh, American people, in my estimation, are the primary target audience of the agency's disinformation operation. And I view Vietnam, the entire Vietnam War, was brought to us, uh, sold to us, by agency disinformation operations. At the, the, uh, when I say us, I mean the American people. Through the media, the U.S. government was pushing their narrative upon the American public being there on the battlefield with the media pushing these false narratives. It was the first time in my life that I had really felt duped. Clearly the information coming in was wrong and that information was being used in a way to psyop the United States of America. Right? They're convincing people things in the war that are happening that are not happening. Like for example, Hillary Clinton landing under the sniper fire to make her out like she was some hero willing to risk her life to fly into Bosnia. I remember landing under sniper fire. There was supposed to be some kind of a greeting ceremony at the airport, but instead we just ran with our heads down to get into the vehicles uh, to get to our base. And the funny thing is, if you've watched the videos of that, when she lands, there's a bunch of little kids giving her flowers. There was no sniper fire in Zagreb. Did she just make that up? She completely made that up. Yeah. I remember landing under sniper fire. We basically were told to run to our cars. Now that is what happened. The news stations have now become churches, and people push their message through their pastors of that news station. And it doesn't matter what news station it is. You've got news stations on the right. You've got news stations on the left. Back in the 1890s and the 1900s, the motion picture was like a quantum computer. It was a way to message people that no one had ever seen in the history yes. of the world. So if you are going to utilize this tool to form and shape narratives to the population, because you know if you can control story, you can control the population. What were the 
companies that were first formed, and what were they called? There was ABC. This is ABC, the American CBS. National Broadcasting Company. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. So, what do those sound like to you? Have you heard of like the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, the DIA? What are those called? Three letter agencies? So if you were setting this up before anybody even thought about any of this stuff and you needed companies to gather information or put information out, you would create networks. Just like you would create Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So the Because you want to control both sides of the narrative. So when you're in the intelligence world and you are needing to gather information or put stories out, what do you do? You hire agents to recruit assets or people to work for you to do whatever you're trying to set up. So what, if you're a journalist or you work for one of these companies, who do you have represent you? An agent? Have you ever looked at the agencies? No. I have. CAA? UTA? More three-letter agencies. UTA was mine. So, same with me. As soon as I put out a shadow, was out, done. Just step back for a minute. Just step back and go, okay, to work in these media corporations or work anywhere, you have to have an agent represent you. Why? Because they have to manage you. Because they need to manage the people that are working in media. So you can't just, you, they don't just give you a platform and just let you go do what you no. want to do. Wow. You're making me look at it all, all those, that 18 years in a whole different way. I remember my boss at 60 Minutes saying, why did your agent call me? I, I don't want to. I don't want to hear from your agent unless we're negotiating your contract. Why do I need to talk to them? I can just talk to you. Now I understand why he. Why he rebelled against them, right? Because he's like, what has it got to do with your agent? Let me go a little further. Yeah, not really, but if you insist. <laughs> well, I'm just saying you're you're um, a pro, you're the pro of pros, and I'm sitting back and I've. These dots have all come together, and I'm like... The agent's my handler, my control officer. I have a crying in a bucket. And so I'm trying to tell you is once... You know, did anything I... I what, makes you wonder if anything you ever did was real. I mean, I know it was real. But it was never what you thought it was. But you, but, but they're so good at convincing you, oh, no, you're just doing this, and you go do this, that. And you are. That's you all are you're, just doing And that. you're competing. And therefore, you can defend it. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, then that's what I mean about the self-sustaining system, right? Oh, you can't tell me what happened in Kabul. I witnessed it. I saw it. I saw the Taliban run. I saw their dishkas, anti-aircraft guns pointed at the sky. I was with in the trenches where they skinned their bodies. And you'll fight to the death to get your yes. story out, and they know it. So, <laughs> sorry. No, it's, you know, you know it. You know it. You just don't know how much you've been used. Do you think I don't know these people? I'm not looking at this from the outside. I have a lot of experience. I know she's married to a CAA agent. Do the math. Who's behind Time's Up? CAA. Where do they meet? CAA. Who needs good PR? CAA. Who are part of the pimp problem? CAA. These are very powerful people you're talking about. They are. So am I. Some of you may not have realized um, that I'm not part of the club. And what I realized with the club is what makes them so mad is when you don't want to be a part of the club, that pisses them off. What club am I talking about? I'm talking about the club of gatekeepers that we all got to deal with. You know who they are, and they definitely know who they are. 
um, a lot of people would be like, what, who, who, who? Come on, man, stop playing. If you ask most people what their number one fear is, <clears throat> what, what do you think it is? Most people's number one fear is public humiliation, okay? I don't give a f anymore. Mm. I'm not afraid of it because I've had plenty. And now it's just time for me to say I'm tough because what does not kill you makes you stronger. We communicate with story. And so psychological operations are to control your story. They manage your fear and they use fear to control you. Obviously fear is a very powerful emotion. Fear is something that in intelligence is like a spice in a food. If you use too much of it, you'll shut someone down. I mean, they, they won't function, they won't be able to, to do anything. If you use too little, they'll blow it off. It's not gonna change their pattern. But the idea is applying enough fear to where you can get the desired results you want. And usually when you utilize fear, you wanna bring out fear in the initial stage where people get very concerned and you start to create a movement or a pattern. And then you feed their dreams or where you tell them their dreams should be. And at the same time, you begin to starve that fear as you feed their dreams. Because ultimately you want to drive people to the, the end goal that you're trying to create. And so you do that by feeding their dreams and starving their fears. Now, sometimes people have a fear already instilled in them, but a lot of times when people have been living in prosperity or they've had a good life, you have to create that fear in order to come in and solve that fear. Polarization is the manufactured sense of life and death. If I can get you polarized, if I can get you your thinking to become polarized, Basically, we're skipping over your ability to critically think about it because we're going right to the emotions. Once we get right to the emotions, you, it's, you naturally get a fight or flight sense or sensation about the situation you're dealing with. Once we get you into that fight or flight sense because you are polarized, logical thinking now goes out the window and now you'll actually protect that thought, you'll pr protect that belief because believing that it's a life and death situation, if you don't support that belief, it may equal your demise, a demise to your family, a demise to your country. So we always want to get people to the polarization phase. We'll dial this way back to something we can all kind of relate to as a kid. I think most people as children, as you're growing up, believe that at some point in time there's a monster under your bed or there's one in your closet. And you lay in your bed and you're, you're afraid that there's something in the closet. You won't open up the door. Your parents can come and say, logically, there's nothing in your closet. But it takes a minute for that child to, to even believe a parent, a trusted source that is there to protect them. The child will still be afraid of that, that, that boogeyman in the closet because now they've, they've jumped over what is logical, they've jumped into their fear space, and they're talking about something that now they are dealing with a life and death situation in their own mind. So this is the thing with adults on, in every region of the world. If you can convince them that there's a boogeyman, they are still gonna doubt even their parent who says there's not. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion or psychological warfare, what it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process, which goes very slow, and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. 
when he talks about a demoralization and how long it takes to demoralize a society. What he's saying is we're going to reshape that society, but first we have to break it down to where they can be shaped. You're talking a generational shift. Who's Victor? I am. Who I've always been. When I worked in the film industry, the way that films are set up and the way that movies work is you, you, you pick an audience, a rom-com. Oh, well, that targets this group of people. Or a, you know, a drama, that targets this group of people. Well, now, with the way that psychological operations have advanced and the way technology's advanced, well, they moved it from demographics to psychographics. Every human being has susceptibilities. So that's why psychographics are so important right now. Because I can reach inside your brain with this little machine that you're holding right now, listening to this show. We can reach inside your brain anytime we want. And I don't want to do it by, okay, are you a 55-year-old male living in Alabama most likely to vote for Trump? No, those are demographics. I want the psychographics. I want, I want to target you based upon, do you wake up in the morning and need coffee what susceptibilities did you just learn by a human being who needs coffee every morning these are psychographics this is where they're getting in your heads if i find out all these things you like because it's on a record what you buy what you watch where you hang out where you spend your time from a psyops from an information warfare perspective you've got the ultimate ultimate weapon at your fingertips social media each one of these platforms is an asset, is a domain of war. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about Twitter, it doesn't matter if you're talking about TikTok. And look at Elon Musk, okay? He is like a general in charge of an artillery army of messaging that's just always going, always going, always going. Seriously, it's an interesting thing. When you're looking at people purchase and changing and set up these platforms, those are massive weapon systems and fifth generation of war. Social media, I always thought of it as social media. I never thought of it as an intelligence gathering operation. But then you start thinking about it and you're like, why do they have the right to just collect my data, collect my psychographics? Because you signed this user agreement, you just agreed to it. And most people never read that stuff. That's how we fall victim. They know we are lazy. How do I get, oh, just click yes. And you click yes and now you have agreed legally. Well, the information that we plug into the system willingly, there's a place in Utah called Bumblehive, and it's a facility you could look up. And this is the scary thing. This is the thing that I don't think the population understands. These platforms, they gather your data, what you like, what you dislike, who you connect with, and the public's like, oh, this is cool, man. After 9-11, then the Patriot Act was introduced, and they thought it would be a good idea to collect everything on everybody at all times. They had to have a place to store this ungodly amounts of data and that's where they came up with this bumble hive facility and that's where you will find that data to the people that don't concern themselves with their information being shared like they're they're open like like me i know whatever i post is going to be processed and stored indefinitely right i know this but i still do it uh, because i have nothing to hide right we all think like that we have nothing to hide well it, it doesn't it doesn't impact us until that digital twin of ourselves, because we're giving that information to them, right? Now I have a Brian sitting next to me that they can fire up on a computer program, a simulation, and say, well, you know, we, we need Brian to do this, or we need Brian to do that. What can I do? What can I show him? Or what, what can I message him? Or whatever the, the vector of attack is, right? Put in front of him. Um, what can I do to change his thought process or to manipulate him to do this or that? And say your mom died a year ago, say your brother died or your sister or your wife, and you want to talk to him and they have a data profile, a clone, a twin in the digital space, well, guess what? You can pay to have access to your dead relative. <laughs> <laughs> 
They're trying to remove you from the world that God created and get you to move into a world that man created to be like the world that God created and slowly, incrementally remove every freedom you have. So you have nothing. A part of that plan, of course, is to induce the gradual surrender of American sovereignty, piece by piece and step by step, to various international organizations of which the United Nations is the outstanding but far from the only example. And now then, because we are introducing this amazing item for the first time in this country, it isn't going to cost you one cent. All you have to do is sign this little scrap of paper and you get your bottle absolutely free. I hereby turn over to ISM Incorporated everything I have, including my freedom and the freedom of my children and my children's children, in return for which said ISM promises to take care of me forever. If the American people were to pay attention to what's going on right now, this would stop immediately. This president sees this episode as the first test case, as the first example for the new world order he is trying to organize. We're here for more than just the price of a gallon of gas. What we're doing is going to chart the future of the world for the next hundred years. This new world order we're attempting to establish, the United Nations is supposed to play a role and fulfill a function, and wherein we, it seems to me, in our own interest, national interest, uh, uh, should be uh, contemplating, participating. All of these social constructed operations that were financed by BlackRock or Arabella or whoever, like you said, World Economic Forum, Bilderberg, uh, Council for Foreign Relations. Yeah, I mean, they're very real. These are, you know, the, all the ones you mentioned are just, these are real things, real with, you know, and they have real people behind them. And they have a, uh, an idea about the future. Well, it's, what's interesting and fascinating now is that they're not hiding it. Not at all. They're not not at all. So they're, they're pretty, pretty out front, pretty blatant about, uh, about what their ideas are and what their goals are and what they're trying to achieve and how much they're trying to achieve and, and in what period of time they're trying to achieve it. Uh, there's no, they're not hiding it. We have all these still myth of free will that everything we choose is of our own free will. And this is a myth that served us well for a couple of centuries, but now it's becoming dangerous. Just as God in the Bible designs and creates animals and plants and humans according to his wishes, now we are learning how to design and create life. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds. But our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. We have to um, mentor the population and to show through our good examples that um, uh, the future requires this change and the change at the end ultimately will be beneficial for them. Because they're so visible, because they're so public, there's no more conspiracy theory argument because in the past, and really only a couple of years ago, if you raised some of the names that you mentioned, the media, the big media, would attack and they'd say, conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theorists. Don't listen to Mike Flynn, listen to this guy. Listen to a Dr. Harari or listen to a Klaus Schwab or listen to some of these other leaders that are part of this organization. Those are two that are very public and they're on record. 
with their ideas, their timelines, and their capabilities. It's very real. Our life in 10 years from now will be completely different, very much affected, and who masters those technologies in some way will be the master of the world. My concern is the ethical side to AI, the ethical side, because there was no ethical side to Google when Google was brought into the castle walls and was unleashed upon the world that they could shape how people think through search engine results. AI is something that's new, but it would take shaping to the next level. It, what it's going to do is it's going to lower the amount of time it takes to shape a large group of people. Initially, say in the 1970s, you didn't have the internet. Most people got their news from one of three TV stations or a newspaper. You could reach these influencers right now with AI and create a consistent narrative through multiple platforms and make it look like it's all individual thought coming from hundreds of different people all thinking along the same line. Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. So you left your job with Google in part because you say you want to focus solely on your concerns about AI. You've spoken out saying that AI could manipulate or possibly figure out a way to kill humans. H how could it kill humans? Well, eventually, if it gets to be much smarter than us, it'll be very good at manipulation because it will have learned that from us. And there are very few examples of a more intelligent thing being controlled by a less intelligent thing. And it knows how to program, so it'll figure out ways of getting around um, restrictions we put on it. It'll figure out ways of manipulating people to do what it wants. The greatest thing is, you don't even have to take my word for this stuff. You can go to uh, NQTEL and look up their articles about artificial intelligence, what they're planning on doing with the artificial intelligence in the space of voting. You can go to OpenAI's website, look at the headline, what they say. They want to steer us in the right direction. Okay, well, who, who holds, who gets to determine what's good for mankind? Well, that's why I raise the concern of um, AI being a significant influence in elections. Um, and, and even if you say that AI doesn't have agency, well, it's very likely that people will use the AI um, as a tool uh, in elections. Um, and then, it, you know, if the AI is smart enough, it, it, are they using the tool or is the tool using them? So I think things, things are getting weird, and they're getting weird fast. Stop for a minute. Check out of your world. Look at what's going on. Because if we don't address this right now, 20 years from now, it's going to get so, so much, the AI will be so advanced, you won't have a chance. Look at what's happening with AI in Hollywood right now. Look at what's happening with the Screen Actors Guild and the stunt performers. They're fighting to keep their intellectual property theirs and if they produce these clones and they move into this new world the art of filmmaking is gone the first people that ai will replace are the artists and they know it they, they put in front of us that they want to be able to scan a background performer pay them 200 bucks and then use that scan into perpetuity we can't sign off on things like that what scares me about AI is when it begins to pretend to be a creative uh, opportunity. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Now, why is data so important? It's important because we've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. You gotta make a choice because whether you wanna make this choice or you don't wanna make this choice, you, this choice is gonna be made for you or your children or your grandkids in the near future. They're showing you what they're doing. They're telling you their agenda. They want to control the entire world and take away your freedoms. And you have a choice. Noel Harari got it wrong. We do have free will, and we do have a choice, and it's not too late. You gotta understand, that's the reality they want us to believe is coming. 
they've had control of our of our story and messaging for so long. When Noel Harari says, "Oh, there is no more free will," they're trying to demoralize us. They're trying to convince us that it's inevitable. The reality that they're talking about is coming. Wrong. Now we know, as technologists, as as ethical technologists, we understand there has to be ethical constraints put on AI. There has to be, and it has to be at a global level. You think the Chinese government care about ethics in their machines that run their wars? Absolutely not. I uh, respect、uh, China's achievements, which are tremendous over the last.、Uh, Over 40 years since the opening up and、uh, policy and reform policy came into action, I think it's、um, a role model for many countries. You have several agendas that aren't competing, but they coexist. You have China, who definitely needs to manage us through any means necessary. And have a deep control on a lot of our politicians, and our media, sports figures, etc. Hang Ai, Hang Jun Zhong, Zhong Guo Gang, Zhong Guo Ren. I'm not sure. The Chinese Communist Party is engaged in psychological warfare through TikTok to deliberately influence U.S. children. China told us what they were going to do. Two Chinese Air Force officers wrote. A book called Unrestricted Warfare, and in that book they talked about how they would subdue another nation. First thing they would do would be to attack a situation economically, from a media, social standpoint, from an entertainment standpoint. They would first go in, and they would co-opt major sports figures. They would co-opt major. People in the media, and the Russians talked about this too. They called them useful idiots, but they wouldn't just co-opt the person. They talked about actually buying the company that held the paper for the company that owned the media organization. So they talked about going in and buying major funds, so they could control what was seen in the culture. The Chinese understood in 1979 that they had to take over the culture. The problem is they're executing so well. On what they said they were going to do. Lawmakers say BlackRock is facilitating U.S. investment in Chinese companies flagged for security risks and human rights violations. The FBI has investigated many cases of CCP intrusions, including making critical arrests surrounding the illegal Chinese police station operating in Manhattan, New York. Arrests the committee asked DHS and FBI about in an April 24th letter、uh, that remains unanswered at this point in time. Right now, the CCP has to destroy the United States because the United States, just because it exists, is a threat to the CCP. Because the people can look and say, "We want to be like America." All the people over in China, the vast majority of them, want to be like America, which can be motivated to overthrow the CCP. It's a society that is not free. It is a society that is under communist, you know, a, a form of Chinese communism.、Um, And they're really, really smart about it. Who's to say that the boy would be happier your way or mine? Why not let him decide? Now I'm afraid it don't work that way. You can't let a young one decide for himself. He'll grab at the first flashy thing with shiny ribbons on it, and when he finds out there's a hook in it, it's too late. Wrong ideas come packaged with so much glitter; it's hard to convince them that other things might be better in the long run. All a parent can do is say, "Wait, trust me." Try to keep temptation away. That means that you're inviting me to leave. That's right. Well, you're wearing a badge, so I leave. It wasn't so difficult. Your problem solved. That's where you're wrong. That boy thinks just about everything you do is perfect. So 
my problem's just beginning. I left behind an awful lot of unscrambling to be done. Look, it's not your fault. It's not your fault you can't see it. It's, these operations are completely designed for that purpose. You are not supposed to be able to see it. We've all been deceived. It's not a, it's not a matter of, you know, well, uh, I got to take an ego shot because I've been deceived. Well, I've been deceived. You've been deceived. We've all been deceived. But, but to really, you know, harness your human nature of not wanting to be controlled by other people, re regardless of even if you agree with who these people are or what they believe, nobody should want to be controlled by other people. Maybe it's great for you today. Tomorrow it may not be so great for you. Most people, Mike, only care about what's 50 feet from their door. I use it metaphorically these days because, you know, what's 50 feet from your door is what most people concern themselves with. I think General Flynn's talking about, like, the physical domain threat. From a cyber standpoint, people don't even perceive it as a threat. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. People know they're being monitored and tracked because they open up their social media and there's the thing they're just talking to their spouse about buying. But they accept that, you know, because of inconveniences. The choice you're going to have to make is, do I continue to be programmed with the media and information that I receive, or do I put a, put a hold on for a second and say, no, I'm going to program myself. I'm going to do other things. I'm not going to just listen. The lie that we're being told is technology is our freedom and the reality is technology is our prison you got to get uncomfortable you're going to have to get uncomfortable you're going to have to get involved you're going to have to do things out you're going to have to go and go wait a minute you know everybody wants to work out everybody wants to go do all these things and get their bodies in shape and they always have these goals and they never do them they know that. It's the same thing. They know that most people won't get uncomfortable. And by the time you realize it's, it's, it's happened, it's too late. You've lost all your freedoms. You're losing, you're going to lose things that you think you're always going to have. And it's just going to go away and there's going to be no one to call. Your leftists in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the, uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation when their job is completed they are not they are not needed anymore they know too much some of them when when they get disillusioned when they see that Marxist Lenin has come to power they, obviously they get offended they think that they will come to power that will never happen of course they will be lined up against the wall and shot we need to be self-reliant like right now right now you're going to see more and more people pushing towards that global communism, towards that great reset, all the things that go with that. And I see the people of not just the United States, but around the world are saying, you know what, I'm going to make myself more self-reliant. I'm going to have my garden. I'm going to have my meat source. I'm going to have my circle of trust where I know I can count on certain people. So I don't have to rely on the government. They, they want you to tune off, That's right. you know, tune it down, right, or turn it off. And, and you no, know, just do what we tell you to do. Right? Don't absolutely. get involved. Go and be that guy that says, I don't do politics. Yeah. I, don't, I don't go, I don't vote, I don't do any of this stuff. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? No. 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 And I am representing Blacks Tennessee. I'm just gonna hop right, right in. It makes you groomers and activist pimps, and we won't have those sitting on a school board who oversees the education of our children. 
And you all sit back smug in your chairs, but you don't want me to read it. Why? Does it bother you? Yes or no? You can't answer that question. You want to know why? Because politically speaking, you can't say that it's wrong. And you don't want me to read the filth because it exposes the truth. How dare you tell me to stop reading it? The FBI initiated a campaign of humiliation and intimidation to punish and pressure me to resign. In violation of HIPAA, individuals at the FBI leaked my private medical information to a reporter at the New York Times. We are here today to tell you, WHO globalitarian misanthropists, we are here today to tell you. You picked this fight. You wanted this fight. Well, guess what? You've got it. Let's fight. These are the people you will have to reckon with from now on. Because we are millions, millions around the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. This Benjamin Franklin quote always rolls in my head is that this resistance, this rebellion against tyranny is obedience to God. And this is why I felt called, you know, out of the military to try to help other people go through that awakening that I did, it's almost like casting nets for souls because honestly, the more you can convince people that the world's lying to them, the more they start looking to God for, for answers. You can't win this fight without the truth and you can't win it without God. So they can have all the power, they can have the weapons, they can have the control, they can have it all, they can have the money, they can have all of it, but there, there's nothing more powerful than the truth. And the truth is, the truth comes from God. You have people that are completely corrupted. They're, they're evil. But if you look at the arc of history, the most powerful, the wealthiest, the most connected people in the world, they never, in the end, are left standing. Because it's always a small group, a small virtuous group, that has unmitigating faith, that stands for truth, that stands for freedom, that will stand up to these folks. You have to look at it and say, why are they doing this? They're doing this because they're afraid, because they're running out of time. And I think as soon as the people say, stop, we're done. This is not happening. I don't care what you put in my feed. I don't care what you tell me in the news. I know what's real, and I'm not playing that game. Their biggest fear, you, you're right, there's a big billionaire class, and that's why their biggest fear is that the population will understand what's actually going on. There would be no need for them to try to influence the entire population if they weren't afraid of them. While no one can see how this gets fixed, I can tell you, you can look back at the arc of history and every kingdom prior to the kingdom of God has failed. If it's not the kingdom of God, we have the kingdom of communism that was held together by force and fell apart when the wall fell. You have the kingdom of capitalism. During World War II, when Eisenhower had a heart attack or afterwards, the stock market dropped by $4 billion during that time. So the kingdom of capitalism was shakable. The kingdom of communism is shakable. The kingdom of socialism always falls apart when you run out of other people's money, shakable. The only kingdom that has never been shaken is the kingdom of God because it's built around the king, the unshakable person in Jesus Christ. And I think if people just come down to the basics, you know, the U.S. Constitution, let's not, let's leave God out of the picture. Or, you know, I'm a Christian. Of course I would want everybody to be a Christian. Of course, in my belief system, everybody should be a Christian. But as an American, Am I going to go out there and rail against the, the Hindu or the Sikh or, 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 or the Muslim, you know? Buddha? No. As an American, absolutely not. All I ask is that you hold true to the foundation of America 
You know, don't come in here and try to convince me that America was founded on this idea or that idea. Let's drop that nonsense. This country was founded on Christian principles, whether you like it or not. I didn't write the book. I didn't write the Constitution, okay? But read it for yourself. My rights are not endowed to me by the administration that runs this country. My rights are endowed to me by, by God, by my Creator. I am optimistic at the moment, but I am pessimistic on the time frame. I think pain is personal, and I'm not sure yet enough people have felt enough personal pain to stand up and do the right thing. But I am confident at some point they will. You got to make a choice because look, we're all dying. You're all going to die. Everybody here is going to die. You're going to be asked one day, and if you don't believe it, I don't care. I don't care if you don't believe it. But one day you're going to stand in front of God. And he's going to say, hey, I showed you this stuff. What did you do about it? I pray to God when I stand in front of God, the one thing I say is, God, I did everything I could do to help you and help your mission and help further peace in the gospel of Christ. That's what I'm, that's what I'm standing for. Thank you for taking the time to watch this film. I want to remind you that freedom isn't free, and it often comes at great personal cost. It takes courage to stand up and speak out and to get involved. But if you've enjoyed this message and you'd like to share it with a colleague, a coworker, a friend, or a family member, please purchase a code and pay it forward. Thank you.